Silver Spring. Yeah, yeah. That was it. Silver Chevrolet Lost
Okay, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Bill Fisher uh, for our seminar series. Uh, Bill got his BS at Carnegie Mellon University and an MS at, at Duquesne, which is also in Pittsburgh. And then he got his PhD at the University of California at Davis in physiological ecology. Uh, he postdoc so before he came to EPA, uh, he postdoc at University of Maryland at Horn Point and then also uh, had a Fulbright Research Fellowship in Brittany, France. And then he was, uh, for a brief time, he was an assistant professor uh, at the Marine Biomedical Institute at the University of Texas. And he joined EPA in 1990, um, and since then he's had a bunch of uh, very diverse research interests, but mainly focused on on invertebrates and more recently on stony coral and I think he would tell you that his true love is uh, oysters and, and toxicology and, and uh, environmental effects on oysters. Um, so more recently Bill has also uh, kind of moved up in the hierarchy uh, in Office of Research De and Development and for a couple of years he was, he was my boss and when the caller ID lit up and Bill was calling the first thought was oh no what did I do wrong and the second thought was, oh no, what's he going to ask me for? <laughs> which, I'm not sure which is worse. Um, but he's currently the Director of Ecology in the National Health and Environmental Effects Research Laboratory, and that's a big national lab. There's about 450 scientists uh, in the lab, and there's four ecology divisions uh, across the country. So today he's going to talk about some work that he's done with stony corals, uh, in, mainly in the Caribbean. And uh, some recent work that he's done, which has been delving more into the social sciences and sort of that uh, fuzzy, uh, not well-defined area that, that most of us are not very comfortable in. And so we were just talking about this, about how to, uh, you know, we often think about stressor response type relationships or what's the ecology driving the organisms, but the bigger question often is really what do the stakeholders and the managers really want from the science? And so he's going to tell us a little bit about that work. Is that working? Apparently, I need to have this. Well, thank you very much, John. It is a pleasure to be here today. It was a great drive over this morning, even though it was windy. You don't notice that in the car. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, John. I do. Is this too loud? Am I too loud? Okay. It feels really loud to me. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. So one was uh, coral reefs, uh, coral reef protection, and how we can work with protection of coral reefs under the Clean Water Act. And then, as John mentioned, I want to change gears a little bit. And, um, you know, we do um, a lot of times think about how we can protect things, how we can uh, understand the biology, chemistry, and uh, physiology in, in, in an environmental and ecological realm. But then we, once we do that, we hand off to decision makers, to our communities, to really okay, so are you going to take this information and do something with it? Can we really protect coral reefs just by saying, here's what we ought to do, or do we need to actually get something in place? So the second part of my talk will be uh, uh, more about uh, how we might uh, communicate with stakeholders and understand what they're interested in. And now I didn't put my glasses on, so I'm going to make a guess that this one is the, the one to move forward. Okay, very good. Um, I'll start off just with a little bit of, uh, of an idea about what the issue with coral reefs is. Uh, coral, re eco coral reef ecosystems are degraded for a number of human, from a, a number of human activities. On the bottom, you see there that reefs in the U.S. and Caribbean, and the, the, the U.S. Caribbean and Florida, have declined from about 50% stony coral cover to less than 10% stony coral cover in about 25 years. You all know what stony coral cover is? It's when you look down from the top and you see a cover. So it's a percent of the area. Okay, so it's really declined. And some data from um, a crimp program that was actually started in 1996. You can see the black line there shows that it's declined down to about below 10% cover. And since that time, it's stayed between 5 and 6% coral cover. 
Um, so you see that it's pretty low, but remember that back in the 1970s, it was up to 40, uh, 50 percent uh, cover. So um, there's a, been a, a huge decline, and it's very unnerving for a lot of us that when you see this record of when we started monitoring, and we say, oh, we haven't lost that much, when in fact we lost a whole lot uh, before we started monitoring. So uh, this is just an example from Kerry's Fort Reef off the uh, coast of Florida, the eastern coast of Florida. And uh, Phil Dustin, uh, the College of Charleston, went out to the same spot every uh, 10 or 15 years and took a, a, a picture. And um, I wanted to use this, but I think that's it, yeah. So you can see these are uh, Acropora palmata. These are the big branched corals that uh, occur. That's a picture that he took in 1975, and over the years he went back. And you see that when these die and they're not regenerated, it, all the structure and habitat that's provided um, by those corals um, is lost, and it just becomes a pile of rubble. So, um, so a lot of people might say, so why do we even care uh, about coral reefs? So we do get a lot from coral reefs. I think most people think about, uh, you know, they look pretty, we should save them. Oops, I just hit the wrong one, sorry. Hit the wrong one here. So biodiversity and existence value, you know, people, aesthetics uh, are all important, but also they're, they, they serve as habitat for a lot of fish species, nursery areas for fish species. They provide shoreline protection and, um, of course, tourism and recreation. And uh, one of the things that we know is coral reef areas, reef areas, uh, have provided a lot of natural products that we use for biomedical and pharmaceutical um, uh, products. So these are some of the things that we get. And so in, in order to get the idea across to people about why we're trying to protect coral reefs, we, sometimes we have to resort to this. It's not just because we're, we're tree huggers, but because these are valuable to us and valuable to our future. So we, um, so we, we try to quantify what these benefits are, and the benefits we call ecosystem goods and services. That are the thing, those are the things provided. And so here we can use some production functions to really understand, for example, um, what if, if recognizing the condition of the, ah, I keep hitting the wrong one, the condition of, uh, say, here, so here are the, earth, the uh, reef areas around St. Croix, U.S. Virgin Islands, and based on the reef condition, we know that they're good and bad areas for biodiversity. Here there's a wave height attenuation around St. Croix. There's almost, they're, very, they're mostly isolated smaller corals, so there's not really much wave attenuation there. So there's not much value there. But you can see that we can begin to apply some knowledge of the services provided and be able to tell people um, what a good reef and what the condition of reef does to, um, to benefit us. And, and quantify that. And we also go so far as, uh, John, this is when we started, I know, when you were there, and uh, we just finally finished it, and that was doing a, an actual evaluation of tourism and how much people pay to come to Puerto Rico uh, to um, visit the reefs. And you can see there's a, a, that got a huge economic impact. That will decline after the hurricanes. Uh, it'll take a while for that to build back up, I'm sure. Um, what do I have to hit here? Did you do some? Did, it was working fine before. It was. Uh-oh. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people recognize that, um, you know, global climate change is you know, warming water temperatures, and this is a real problem for corals. It's something that EPA doesn't work with uh, so much, but we do work with the watershed stressors. So one of the things that we want to... Um, we, we can work with and we have regulatory ability uh, to deal with is uh, water quality standards. So a lot of those stressors that we saw on one of the first slides were coming from the watershed. So most often the Clean Water Act and people that use the Clean Water Act to protect habitat or to protect uh, their water resources are, are based on chemical and physical parameters. Okay, we can't allow this much mercury in there. You have to have um, you have to have limits on the amount of cadmium that's in the water or the amount, et cetera. But we can also use a biological condition to set water quality standards so, uh, and thresholds. And what's really great about that is that 
biological condition is a great integrator over time of multiple stressors. So instead of just going cadmium, mercury, copper, here's a problem with this chemical, a problem with PAHs, a problem with PCBs, instead you're looking at the cumulative effects on the organisms that you care about. And you can set thresholds for their condition, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. The good news also for biological endpoints is that biology is what's most, uh, what most coral reef managers uh, already measure, and they also are, they resonate with the public. Those are the things that we care about. We don't care about how much cadmium is in the water column. We do care that there are fish there for us to look at. Am I going to have to do this again? Oh, it's working now. Working. Yep, thanks. So it's not like we just made this up. Clean Water Act thought about this um, in, back in 1970. So you can see in the different um, sections of the Clean Water Act that biology, biological monitoring and assessment, and guidelines are um, hit on several times. So what do we need to do if we're going to develop biocriteria that for coral reefs? By biocriteria, I mean how can we use our assessment methods and the, the, the results we get from those assessments to set thresholds to say that a water body is impaired or it's okay? And so one of the, some of the things that we knew going into this were that we don't set water quality standards on a reef or a coral or a small bay or an inlet. You have to have uh, wide... You have to have very broad regional areas uh, to, to make these decisions. And this is a hard one for coral experts to get their, uh, to get their, um, to uh, really understand because most coral reefs experts go out and they measure their favorite reef and they go and they, they look at the decline. But to think about it in really broad terms and to ha recognize the spatial um, importance of saying that this region is meeting water quality standards is different than this reef looks good or bad. Um, we also needed to have some biological in, uh, condition or integrity indicators that were responsive to human disturbance. Most people that study the decline of coral reefs don't think about linking it to human disturbance. The Clean Water Act doesn't say we can go ahead and just uh, do whatever. If we think it's degraded, we'll, we can go in and uh, manage it. We can regulate it. It has to be tied to some human disturbance uh, for the Clean Water Act to be brought into play. Uh, we also have to have a sampling protocol, a sampling design to efficiently collect all the information for these indicators. And, you know, going out uh, to hundreds of sites and getting underwater and making measurements on corals and other critters is expensive. These uh, territories and uh, states can't necessarily do that very easily, so you have to find out a very efficient way of doing that. You have to make it so that it's going to be a sustainable long-term monitoring program. You can't do it once. You have to be able to do it every three or four years at a minimum. And then we have to have some characterization of what reference condition is, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, and define those criteria or thresholds. Are you freezing? <laughs> I, I thought it was a little chilly in here. All right. So those are the things that set out in front of us and that we realized those things needed to be done about 2002 or 2003 to move forward. So we started out on surveys. We were very fortunate to have a nice 250-foot ship, uh, the OSV, the Ocean Survey Vessel Bold. We took her on seven different cruises uh, across the Caribbean and Florida. And the reason it took that much time and energy was because we had to fulfill some of these requirements to make biocriteria that came out at the other end of this defensible. They have to be defensible if somebody's going to go to court. So um, how do we find out that this is uh, something that's caused, the, if there's a decline, that it's related to human disturbance? Well, this was one way we did it. You can see that we're here, and this is on the south side of St. Croix. You can see there's an industrial zone there. That's a center of human disturbance. We don't really have to know what the disturbance is. We just really need to be able to say that if, there, if the coral condition by our measurements is lower in that area, then it's probably related to the human disturbance. So that's what we do, exactly. So we take a bunch of stations and we look at the corals all along um, this area, and then if we plot that as a distance from docks, you can see many of our indicators that 
The further you get away from that center of disturbance, the better your condition is using our indicators. And so that is good defense. So when somebody says, how do you know that that indicator, you could blame that on humans? Well, you know, you could probably argue it a number of ways, but this kind of evidence really builds a, a, a weight of evidence for, yes, what we're measuring is a response to human activity. Another way of doing that is to <clears throat> look at it a little bit differently, and, and actually this was John's idea, if I remember correctly, and that is that we can take um, each of these watersheds on St. Croix, and we know that every watershed drains out into coral reefs nearby, and so if we look at all the stations we took around the island and then line it up with the, uh, it's, it's called a Landscape Development Intensity Index, um, really it's if I remember, it's very highly correlated to the, uh, I, would say, I would say permeability. What's the word? Imperv Impervious surfaces. Uh, and, and you can see that the more landscape development you have, the, the less coral condition you have. So th those are two good ways of taking a look at the data that we pull together to be able to relate. Again, be, amass that weight of evidence that says, if somebody asks, here's why we think these indicators are responsive to human disturbance. So that's an important, um, important step forward for us. So we had a lot of other things. Uh, we ended up measuring a lot of different things. One of the things that we initiated that uh, still struggles for survival is uh, actually measuring the size of the corals. We think demographics is very important in terms of um, getting an understanding of um, the, how long something might be under stress. If you, so just as an example, you go out and you have uh, a species of coral where you have one that's this, this big uh, in an area and you have lots of those versus you have in a different area a bunch of the same species that are smaller. Um, you, you know, you get an idea of whether or not it's been good or bad in that area for a long time. If you have a big coral colony, that means it's been good in that environment for a long period of time. So um, in any case, our 3D colony size measurements uh, have now been adopted by NOAA's Coral Reef Monitoring Program. They don't apply it exactly the same way we do, but it's a great step forward, so we're glad we introduced it. The other part of all those surveys that we had to do was really to get this down. So we had to know, um, had to make decisions on the area to be sampled. I mean, a coral reef is just not a coral reef. A coral reef is a very scattered um, environment and so uh, you have the spur and grooves, uh, scattered pavement, patch reef, linear reef, there's all different kinds, all different kinds of habitats. So you have to make, you have to try some of those and see which ones are going to work best uh, for your overall purposes. Uh, you, you have to um, work out the efficiency of what you're doing underwater. Uh, we stayed really close to shore because you don't dive deep that way. And if you're looking for watershed stressors, they're going to be closer to shore or more, more easily found closer to shore than further away. So uh, that saved us a lot of dive time. Uh, NOAA, for example, they're looking, they have responsibility for all reefs. And so they go a lot deeper looking at reefs. And they always ask us, well, why don't you go into these reefs that are deeper? It's, it's diluted. You know, the effect that we're getting from the watershed is diluted. Our purpose is to find are there watershed effects? <clears throat> so we had a lot of things to work with, to, to work out. And one of them uh, also was recognizing the limitations of any particular jurisdiction, like U.S. Virgin Islands. How many people can they afford to go out diving? How many stations can they do in a two-week period? How many years can they do it in a row, et cetera? So we've offered, in fact, they're about ready to implement this rotating panel design um, so that you can separate out regions to be sampled. They can do 60 stations in a year in a, in a, in a two-week period is what we believe they're capable of. And so we divide it up uh, from all of the stations are um, randomly selected in an area, but you'd want to go back every year to 10 of those that were randomly selected and pick another 40 randomly again. And then of course you have, uh, and that gives you both spatial and temporal vari variability over time. <clears throat> and then finally, we give them 10 stations that if they have a question they want to answer specifically about, well, does the sediment coming out of Guanaca Bay um, c 
kill corals? Is that causing a real problem? They could set up some stations there, and they could all get them done every, um, every year, and they could meet their reporting requirements for the Clean Water Act. So those are the kinds of things that we had to work about, work through. And so uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of all of this, it took quite a bit of time to do that, but um, we had all those checked off, and now we came to the part about, okay, now that you have the indicators that are responsive to human disturbance, now that you have a regional perspective, a probabilistic sampling program, uh, efficient methods, um, how do you characterize reference condition, and then how do you set those thresholds that you're going to use in your water quality standards? <clears throat> a reference condition is, what everybody thinks about a reference condition is a spot that's untouched. There are no such places, so we always say minimally disturbed. And it's not one place. What you do is you try to go to a handful of places, several places, many places if you can, that ha are far away from human disturbance. And that way, you, those are your reference conditions. If you can average them, you treat them uh, as though they are a composite. And then thresholds, um, I, I, I say here, it, they can be narrative or numeric. That's just another word for qualitative or quantitative. Um, but they have to be understood to represent integrity of the reef. That, that's what's acceptable. Anything less than reef integrity is not acceptable. And those are the kinds of standards that you're trying to set that these jurisdictions are going to try to hold their communities to. So um, it's really important that we get this right. <clears throat> so how do we go about doing that? Well, best way to do it is to bring experts together that have uh, strong opinions and uh, in insights to uh, coral reefs and what a coral reef should look like. Many of the folks that we brought together have um, 30 and 40 years of experience. So they've been able to see what reefs used to look like. And so they know before a lot of things started going south, uh, what things, what it looked like and what they remember is t entirely different what we have now. But what we did was, um, Oh, I like the way this stretches it out here. <laughs> Makes the, that's a book there. Uh, it, it just looks fatter. Um, but uh, we had about 25 people. We gave them um, photographs and videos of uh, 12, yeah, 12 survey stations. And we said, take two hours. Take your time. Look at all these videos. Look at, look at these and tell us whether you think this is a good, fair, or a poor station. And, um, and they did that. And then also why you think it was good, fair, or poor. And then we tried to work for some consensus rankings and from that defined categories. So our experts actually came up, they decided there should be four uh, categories with descriptions of the attributes in each. So here's just an example then of some of the things that they came up. What would make a reef that they were looking at uh, very good to excellent? And so. High rigosity, meaning high structure, structural complexity, complexity um, high species diversity, uh, large autotrophic sponges, a, a number of things uh, for, in terms of uh, vertebrates, long-lived species, um, fish, balanced species abundance. These are pretty generic general terms, and they get us a little closer, but they're not really that helpful in terms of setting a threshold because before a judge, you're going to argue, well, that seems like that's excellent to me. So we have to do a little bit better than that. Um, so one of the things that comes out of this, though, is that you recognize that condition changes with uh, stress. And so we can stretch this out on an axis like this. And we can actually measure, uh, make, we are, we've already done this part. We've already separated out condition and have some ideas about good, fair, and poor. But now we, we need to know, what, what is this over here? Because this is a very characteristic uh, uh, graphic of how things look. High human disturbance, it's poor. Low human disturbance, it looks better. So we do have some measures of that. And we can begin to put this on, a <clears throat> on the graphic. So you remember this one um, illustration of landscape development intensity index, or the impervious surface the development of the watershed, that can be just put right down here almost exactly this, to represent that as well. And so um, we can see how, now how we can begin to put condition and stress together. 
The value of this is if you're a, um, a manager and you find out that your, um, the condition of your region is right here and you want to go to there, then you know that you have to change your watershed stress from there to there. That's simple. We're not telling you how to do it. We're just saying now you have, you have some measurement of how to make that change. You know you have a, a milestone or a goal to look for. But it turns out that this is, we're not, not the only ones that have done this. And so uh, this is called the biological condition gradient. It's get, becoming more and more standard. Um, a lot of the folks that uh, work with these are focused primarily on uh, you know, how it goes from the high condition to the low condition based on changes in structure and function. And you can look that up if you want. It's a, just a, a framework for looking at this. But we've met with this coral reef expert panel now for over three years, probably a dozen different times, sometimes webinars, sometimes in face. We have our hopefully last in face meeting um, in March coming up. <clears throat> the fish folks have done a lot better than the stony coral folks, and they've actually come out with our narrative and actual numeric criteria as well for a particular station. So um, you can see what, so they're pretty much finished, but we haven't gotten this far yet with the uh, stony coral group or the benthic group. So you can see that the qualitative aspect, here are some descriptions of what you think should be there to be acceptable. And here are, based on um, a lot of interaction, here are some of the values now we can put numbers or quantify. If you don't have one of these things, then it probably is not passing muster as uh, in terms of your water quality standards. So the good news for us is that now um, we did a lot of this work in Virgin Islands and then a lot in Puerto Rico. And now uh, I think Virgin Islands will be the first um, territory to implement water quality standards using biological criteria in 2020 and we expect that Puerto Rico will follow in 2022. Does that save coral reefs? Not really, but it gives them a tool to use uh, to help with the water quality. For any information on this, we have a number of publications that if, uh, if you're interested, get a hold of John and I'll make sure you get them. <clears throat> I did a, a slide into this other aspect and that is, okay, so maybe we can help protect coral reefs by the kinds of things that we do. But we still have to, um, we still have to have community buy-in. We still have to have the communities, the region, the, the territory, the state, wanting to do this. And and I, I don't say that facetiously, because um, it, it's. I was telling John earlier. You know, when I started out, I thought you know, as, as an ecologist, if I can understand how the the the, the physical, chemical, and biological pieces interact and we can find out what we're doing wrong, we could change that. It's easy enough, okay? So I've spent a lot of my life trying to figure out what those interactions were. What I realized in just the last few years is getting that far really just opens up the can of worms for an entirely new area of research for me, not for everyone, but for me, and that is the interaction of economic, social, and environmental issues. So how do decision makers decide? They don't decide based on the fact that I'm trying to protect a coral reef. For crying out loud, listen to me, I'm going to protect that reef. That's only one of many things that they have to consider. So how do we begin to balance this? How do we inform the community and the stakeholders about the value of it? And how do we help them to balance it, um, th those values against other values they have? So um, <clears throat> let me just uh, start with a description. This is Guanica Bay in uh, southwestern Puerto Rico, um, where there's concern over effects of watershed stressors once again, and it became the very first of the uh, Coral Reef Task Force uh, watershed initiatives. And the first thing out of the gate, they developed the, oh, they did the, they developed the Guadalca Bay Watershed Management Plan. It was not a bad plan, it was a very low cost, uh, uh, contract to the Center for Watershed Protection. They came up with some good stuff to think about. But I'm going to tell you wh why we kind of dug ourselves a hole with that. And, and then what I'm going to do is when EPA got involved, when we got involved, we decided we needed to um, in engage the community a little bit more. And so that's when I'm going to talk about uh, 
this morning is a little bit more about these particular aspects of the community discussion about coral reef protection and engaging social, economic, and other uh, watershed values. All right, so here were some of the things that were identified in the watershed management plan. There were a lot of, just a lot of things in there, and they all had a, they were all reasonable, and there was a, a purpose for them, but I was just mentioning to John uh, as well that you can begin to organize these things that they thought of. Here are the things that they were doing over here, but each of these things has to have a purpose. And so this means ends network for Guanica Bay Management Plan, we can put together and just say, well, some of these things were meant to conserve fresh water, to preserve topsoil, et cetera, et cetera. And, and those led into even broader and importantly, more acceptable objectives for just about everyone. So you go over to what's called a, a fundamental objective, everybody's going to agree with that. There's not going to be any great controversy over ecological integrity or economic benefits. So the questions come later uh, when you try to figure out what's the best way to do it because there's trade-offs with each one of these. But I just wanted to put this up there because it's such a simple approach that helps um, uh, makes, it, makes things a little more transparent. So a means ends network, the really nice thing about it is you can always just ask yourself if you're building one, so why I'm doing this, why is this important? And then you ask it again, and you ask it again, and go on until you really understand what objective your fundamental objective is. And then also, then if you have a, a fundamental objective, enhanced social well-being, you can ask the question, how do I go about doing that? And you can start finding things. Some of the things you thought of way over here when you just first started play very well into all of those. But then you're going to realize at some point that you have some really important fundamental objectives over here that you didn't do squat with. You never even thought about them over here. So you can go backwards. That's why it's good to engage the community, find out what those fundamental objectives are. Let me just give you a little bit of um, background on one of, the, one of the major problems in Guanica Bay was watershed sediment. You can see here that they have a lot of, um, uh, I just about said tobacco farms. Coffee farms, not tobacco farms. Um, and uh, they used to have tobacco farms, but a lot of coffee farms are sun-grown uh, farming of uh, coffee. And, of course, the sediment runs off from that sun-grown coffee and comes out. This is the uh, Rio Loco coming out into Guanica Bay. You can see it's heavily laden with sediment after rainfalls. Uh, and here is Guanica Bay looking at the overhead shot of it. There's the Rio Loco coming in. And here it comes out. And, of course, there are coral reefs all, all out here. And when it collects, when sediment collects on reefs, we believe it has a negative effect on them. <clears throat> so that's the problem. The Guadalca Bay Watershed Management Plan said, okay, here are some things we can do. We can convert to shade-grown coffee. Uh, that's expensive. It takes about seven years. You have to plant different berries, different varieties. Uh, we can dredge the reservoirs. The reservoirs are now about half full with sediment. I'll mention that in a little, in a little bit. And the sediment's, uh, uh, the sediment's collected in those reservoirs, and that's a good thing. It keeps them from going downstream, but it, it begins to ruin the reservoirs. We can restore the Guanica Lagoon, which was there up until 1950 when they put in an irrigation system, um, and that uh, restored lagoon would collect nutrients and sediment. Likewise, riparian planting, uh, you know, hydro seeding, and then uh, correcting some of these. Uh, they did some irrigation back in the old days that really ended up ruining the, the banks of the rivers uh, like you see right here and so they want to try to fix those as well. So there are a lot of different things to try to address this issue with sediment coming downstream and affecting coral reefs. So when we um, decided that we would jump into this, we um, brought to the for a structured decision-making framework <clears throat> and I know if you're like me, you're going, oh, yeah, another, another cycle thing. But th this is really good, and, and the, the value of this, and there are many like it, but they all follow a very similar thing. Important in this is that it allows you to consider two important things, stakeholder values, which are not the same thing as scientific knowledge. And a lot of times when we do the science, like I said, we think, okay, now we've, we've solved that, let's move on. But no, we have that scientific 
that scientific knowledge is important, but stakeholder values uh, are, is what's eventually going to drive the, the ship one way or another. So there are a lot of strengths to an, a structured decision-making framework. I'm just going to quickly go through them. You have to understand the decision context. You know you have a problem, but there's more than just coral reefs are bad. What, what are the other issues that uh, play into it? You have to understand what the stakeholders want. What are their objectives based on the values of their community? You need to then base your alternatives on those values and stakeholder input. What we did in the Guanica Bay Management Plan was get the Center for Watershed Protection to come and say, here's your alternatives. We didn't do any of this. So it ran into trouble. It ran into trouble primarily because of the lagoon. And the lagoon uh, was the areas used for farming. So the farmers fought back. They said, you're not going to restore this lagoon. And uh, so that's an economic issue. Uh, but from these alternatives, you can estimate cons consequences and trade-offs, because there's always a trade-off with every decision, and then implement, monitor, and review. So uh, that's assuming you implement something. Or even if you don't implement, what are you going to monitor? Uh, but that's the, a very well-recognized, well-known decision, structured decision framework. I just wanted to mention, that, that once again, that we decided to focus on this area first and actually drag the process back up to clarifying the decision context and talking to stakeholders, even though the management plan that it brought us all, several alternatives was already out there. <clears throat> we actually held four workshops. Um, uh, each one of them was slightly different focus. The first one was really about the watershed management plan, talking to mostly resource managers and the like about, you know, what do you think about these um, different proposals that are on the table. We also had a historic decisions workshop, which was to talk with farmers and fishermen in particular to say, how are decisions made here in your neck of the woods? And of course the answer was, they're all made in San Juan, which is on the northeast, not the southwest. They're all made in San Juan, and they don't ever listen to us. Even when they say, even when they ask us, they decide whatever it is that they want. So there was a lot of, a lot of concern about local empowerment and the like. So. Uh, different things came out of that. Uh, the, the bottom line of, of I'm, I'm going to spend a little time on uh, this one right down here. That was where we actually brought in folks from the entire watershed to talk about their contributions to the problem and what kind of issues they had about uh, the potential resolutions to that problem. <clears throat> so the first thing we learned is that, you know, when you, when you go in and you begin to speak to the public, about stuff. Now, many of you may recognize some of these things, but folks that are building homes for a living, folks that are selling insurance for a living, a lot of these terms are just woof, way over there, and there's so many of them. There's no really, what does it all mean, has to be the question. So we really came up with a, what we think is a really good way of, of framing uh, issues and allowing people to see the linkages among these different things. It's called the Dipser Systems Framework. It's uh, actually it's based, I, I don't know, John, you may have remembered years ago there was a PSR, a pressure state response system, where the pressures, meaning environmental pressures, uh, changed the state of the ecosystem, and then humans could respond by managing that away or accepting it. But, uh, uh, but this is an upgrade to that, and that is, not only does it recognize the, the pressure, the human activities that create the stress, the change in condition by that from that stress and the response of society to that. But they've added two really important things. One is the impact, and that is how does that change in state impact how we benefit, what we benefit from that. And then to put up here the driving forces or the D, the driver in all of this, is this is where the trade-offs occur. If you're going to do so, if you're going to make, uh, if you're going to make them tr uh, switch convert from uh, sun-grown to shade-grown coffee, that might be good for tourism and recreation on coral reefs, but hard on agriculture. Those are where you begin to recognize those trade-offs. And so I'm going to give you an example here. <coughs> and don't, it looks complicated, but it's really not. It's, um, I, I circled down here coral, because that's the focus. This is a coral reef systems, dipser systems model. And you can just see that there is a a place for almost everything that you think about in terms of what affects it. And you can follow things back up to the top 
to these socioeconomic sectors that we have that are really important. That's where the trade-offs occur. Um, so I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to leave it with that and just introduce that to you. That is available at a website here. I tried it before I came. If you just, if you just Google um, EPA and ReefLink, you'll get to this. But it describes, um, it describes all the different things that go in behind this system. We actually, to develop this system, we had, well, John, you were the lead of one group, weren't you? Huh? You did pressures group, okay. We had seven different, uh, five different groups, I guess, with about half a dozen to ten people on, on each group of coral reef experts talking about what to good, put into each of these. So Dipser has been a very good tool, and I'll show you why. When we had one of our first meetings in, uh, in uh, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, we divided groups up into, um, I think, three or four different groups that were there, and we said, would you look at these um, different things that have been proposed by the, watershed, by the watershed management plan and spill them out into a DIPSER model for us. We gave them an introduction to DIPSER first. We gave them some examples, and then we cut them loose. I think it was two or three hours. And you can see that this one group that focused on agriculture, this was all on the fly. This is the actual, except for my, the things I added here, this is what they came up with as a group of all the things that changes to agriculture could affect. And that includes agriculture, tourism, reefs themselves, the aesthetics, connectivity, public health, cultural benefits, fisheries, etc. People began to see these linkages really easily using this system. So I thought that was very telling, very important for us. It brought a huge level of transparency to the process. I wanted to show you one other, and this is the, another on-the-fly stakeholder meeting uh, a group. This one was on the um, uh, lagoon restoration. Tell us what you think the lagoon restoration would do. And we were struck by uh, <clears throat> the outcome. They, theirs was not nearly as detailed, but we were struck by this one. In the middle of it is mosquitoes. And we said, well, that's great. What does that mean when they came back? And, they, and one of the, the guy who put it in there said, well, mosquitoes are a big deal here. So um, this is the lagoon footprint right over here. That would be restored. In other words, that would be covered in a meter or two of water. And um, since the time, since the 1950s, this town of Fuig has grown out from the river all the way out to where the lagoon is. That means that those people are going to have to deal with mosquitoes. And that's a big social concern and a public health concern. They've got uh, dengue virus and chikungunya virus this before Zika. And of course, there's the, the, the specter of having to use a lot of pesticides out there as well. So there's some trade-offs there, regardless of all the other trade-offs. For this local community, for this, this particular town, there's great recreation and aesthetic opportunities, but there, you also have uh, this downside. So these are trade-offs that, you know, through this process that we didn't even realize were there. Uh, and that's in addition to the farmers not wanting you to flood it. All right, so this was the public values forum. I want to talk about some of the things we did there. Uh, the, we did try to identify those stakeholder objectives that we mentioned earlier. And for the entire watershed, not just for corals, because we needed to know how the decisions we're making are affecting several different objectives, not just our singular objective. And then develop alternatives for achieving those objectives, look at the trade-offs and the unintended consequences, and then prioritize management actions. Non-binding, but just to get a better sense of it. I just want to, I, I know you can't read that over there. I took some and blew it up over here just to give you an idea uh, of, um, they came up with a lot of alternatives in our, in our public values work group. And uh, some of them are pretty interesting. Uh, improved mechanism for water drainage. Uh, there's the restore the lagoon. Uh, consistent enforcement of regulations. A lot of that had to do with uh, fisheries. Um, established riparian buffers. Uh, land acquisition for conservation purposes. There were a lot of novel things, as far as we were concerned, that we wouldn't have come up with. So this was a very good exercise for them to come up with their own alternatives and uh, share them with us. I did want to highlight this. Again, John and I were talking about this just earlier today. Is It's really important in this process to identify performance measures. A performance measure is what you're going to measure 
to see whether or not you met that objective. The quick example for this is, if you say my objective is good water quality, that's great, and it's a great objective. But what are you going to measure? Are you going to measure salinity? Are you going to measure tur turbidity? Are you going to measure the bacteria in the water column? Uh, are you going to measure chlorophyll A? It depends on what your concern is, and you definitely have to identify those performance measures so that somebody in your community, a stakeholder, says, yeah, I'm all for water quality. Two days later, they find out you're measuring salinity, and they thought you were measuring chlorophyll A. So, it, it, you know, we want to make it clear up front what it is we're concerned about and what we're going to measure. And this group was very good about that. They knew they wanted to pinpoint their objectives by um, real measurements. Then you, you, one of the th turning points for me in this was really great. Uh, I have to say we had two really good facilitators from uh, Vancouver, actually, uh, Dan Gregory and Luis Gonzalez. And uh, Luis w w spoke Spanish as well, which meant that we got a lot more input than we did when we spoke only English. And, um, but uh, Dan Gregory is very well known for decision. He's the structure. He runs, he invented that structure, structured decision process. So um, these were great people to have on here. Um, this, this part is where you begin to see that if you have different alternatives, different decisions that you could make, in this case, leave it alone, restore the lagoon, maybe restore the lagoon partially, maybe do the lagoon in steps or whatever it is that you've decided, many alternatives there. It's not just about how does it reduce sediment and nutrient. It's about some of these bigger objectives over here, and there are multiple objectives. So. How does it protect and create economic opportunities? How does it restore and conserve land management and environment? Uh, how does it restore and conserve the aquatic environment? So these are the things, and we did not get into this for, for any particular issue, but it gives you an idea of now you've moved from a single objective that you started with because that was your concern to how do we weave this into the overall quilt of decisions being made for the watershed that consider economic, social, and environmental issues. So then there were some priority actions that came from all of this. And we, again, we had several groups working on it. They came up with a variety of different um, uh, actions that they thought would be their high priorities. And then we actually, we had a, a system, um, automa automated system, anonymous, where everybody got a little pad and you got to vote anonymously and it would compile the votes so for each group we went through and said how many people support this or I might have done something like um, identify the top three for you or something like that and so you know something like that uh, comes out and these were some of the, the and this was non-binding but it was really good just for people in the room to get a sense of how many alternatives there were also to hear why other people liked one alternative versus another, because this created a lot of conversation and discussion. Some argument, but mostly very civil. I wanted to stop, uh, uh, step into, um, am I doing okay on time? Okay, we'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, so then we get to the part back to where we can actually estimate consequences uh, in evaluating some of the trade-offs. Uh, and that is where scientific research needs to come into this. Now we know what some alternatives are, alternatives generated by the stakeholders. How can we help them make those decisions? So one of the questions that continually came up was these, these reservoirs in the watershed. The reservoirs had a lot of value to people in the watershed. And so uh, they were more interested in this um, because the reservoirs are about 50% filled with sediment now. So they're not as functional as they used to be. There's reduced water storage capacity. And for our um, singular purposes on coral reefs, they've been capturing a lot of that sediment that otherwise is going to go downstream in, out onto the reef. So, um, so even though it was a corollary um, project that I'm going to describe to you right now, uh, it also served to address questions about, whether, uh, about how we control sediment going to coral reefs. So this is just a, an overview, really, of there are five reservoirs. These were built in the 1950s to support sugarcane production in the Lajas Valley. So it comes down, it collects actually through tunnels. Most of it's collected in Lago Lucchetti, which is this big, big reservoir right here. 
it passes through Lago Loco, and then it's distributed, part of it into Rio Loco and down here, but part of it goes through a, an irrigation system around uh, Lajas Valley, but then is returned back to Guanica Bay. So a very complicated system for following the water. But we decided to take a look at um, two alternatives how can, uh, uh, of extending the longevity of the reservoirs. And so by that I mean how long, bef how long before those reservoirs are completely filled with sediment. And so one of the alternatives we looked at was um, conversion of sun-grown to shade-grown co coffee. Now there's, we've already mentioned there's some um, advantages and some disadvantages to making that change. You can see uh, you can grow coffee uh, in shade, but it, it takes a lot to change over and um, you worry about the marketing as well. You already have a market. If you change, you get to retain a market. But that was one alternative. The other was to actually go in and drange, uh, um, dredge the reservoirs. And there are some advantages to that and some disadvantages as well. Um, we set up a, um, there were several scientific challenges to address these two questions. Again, we're trying to answer questions that will help them make a decision. <clears throat> so one of the science challenges was to really understand, assess the contribution of sediment from those uh, shade sun-grown farms, and if they were converted to sun-grown, how would that change, uh, shade-grown, how would that change? Um, and then the other was to estimate the loss of trapping efficiency by those reservoirs. The more they fill up, the less they can trap, because, you know, the deeper the pit, the more that will stay in there. But as the pit fills up, then much of the sediment goes downhill. And I think it's this uh, line right here. So a annual accumulated sediment, in, as the accumulated sediment um, uh, it, it, the, the accumulated sediment goes down as the, the water st uh, storage capacity goes down and um, more of it goes out of the reservoir. And that's what we don't like is it going out. So, so that we had to calculate. We used a, um, we developed a model to try to uh, uh, incorporate not only the com complex part of five reservoirs, but uh, where the sediment came from and how much went out from each reservoir to try to determine the life expectancy of Lago Lucchetti, which was the fourth, not the fifth. Uh, but that way we felt was the, perhaps the biggest reservoir had the greatest influence. And we used a Bayesian net. I don't know if you guys are, are familiar with that, but if you have a chance in your life to study Bayes nets, I wish I had. They're, the value of Bayes nets is not only that they're a probability, but uh, you can set your own values. For me, it's really important because you can commingle uh, qualitative and quantitative values. And so, um, but you can see here in this particular thing is a question about whether or not we dredge Lucchetti over here. What happens if we uh, convert? Um, and you can see in some cases we did a lot of discretization just because we wanted to make sure, we, we, we didn't want to miss any probability in there. But the bottom line of all this was, uh, when we, we looked at it, if we were going to convert, well, well I'll start with, with no conversion, there was about 48 years left for Lago Lucchetti. Um, if we implemented coffee, partially, it would be 52 years. If we did the coffee conversion, the most we could have gained was from 48 to 56 years. But obviously, if we dredge, that really had the biggest effect that we could, in fact, increase the ability of those reservoirs to live a lot longer, uh, to 81 years. And if we did them both together, we could get it up closer to 90 years. But uh, clearly, so well, this is not giving somebody an answer. It's giving them information. It's not making a decision. It's giving them information. If you can afford the cost of dredging those reservoirs, you're going to do a lot better, actually dressing just this one reservoir, you're going to do a lot more in terms of set, uh, resetting the clock on that reservoir serving all the purposes it serves and reducing the download stream of uh, sediment. So we have a report on that too that you're, I'll be glad to send it along. I just have, uh, on this second part, I just wanted to hit a couple of take-home messages because I know I ran through a lot of things pretty fast. It's really important to have stakeholder engagement. You are not, 
you, you're not in the business of imposing regulations on people without them having some sense about what it is. So you have to engage them early and often, and you have to understand their objectives, the alternatives that they think are out there for you, and you also have to consider the changing decision landscape. Remember that very first thing was decision context? Well, we changed that with mosquitoes. Now all of a sudden, mosquitoes is something that we didn't know about that now we do know about. So we have to be, accommodate that. Use this structured decision approach. It allows you to look at both science and values. Use the systems framework to, pri to provide that transparency. That was the DIPSER model. It really helps identify unintended consequences, and it's a great conversation starter. People begin to ask questions about, well, does that fit in there? How about this? Well, how about that? And so it really um, moved the conversation forward a lot. The consequence, uh, uh, consequences of the different object, um, decisions, remember the consequence table we showed that we hadn't filled out, but um, it was some people use that for a lot of major decisions. And then, I don't think I stress this enough, <clears throat> value-added research. A lot of folks, myself included, we do research because we're interested in what it is uh, that's driving something. What's the mechanism behind it? What, uh, and it's curiosity-driven, and that's good, and there's a great value in that. When you're trying to work for somebody and inform somebody about decisions, they don't need to know things about, um, uh, I, I don't know, the stony coral demographic uh, population studies when they're trying to answer whether or not the sediment is going to affect the corals. So you have to find out uh, what we call value-added information. And so for us, the value-added information was, let's take a look. This was something they were concerned about, and it affects coral reefs. What about giving them information on that will inform their decision on dredging the um, reservoirs or converting coffee? Uh, so I think that's really valuable, and, and it's a hard lesson to learn, is you might want to go somewhere with something, but you've got to listen to what the options are and really decide what information is going to help them go one way or another. And if you have done research that doesn't influence them one way or the other, it's really, it's kind of academic. But I hope you get a publication out of it anyway. All right, I think that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much, and John, thank you for inviting me. This has been great. Thanks.